my first epistemology course was with Arda Denkel in uh, 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 TB, uh, I don't know, maybe was it somewhere on the first floor and uh, in the building. And um, it was, um, it was announced that like Arda Denka, he announced that we were, our course epistemology was gonna be about knowledge. Obviously he went on explaining what that meant. And he made sure to uh, point out that knowledge that versus knowledge how was gonna be our focus. So not uh, knowing how to ride a bike or uh, knowing how to play tennis, Etc. But rather, knowing that there's a tree outside my house, knowing that uh, two plus two equals four, etc. Whatever. So that distinction by itself has come under some criticism. But um, what I'm going to talk about is not some theoretical problems with that distinction but the way it is drawn and how there are some political problems with the distinction. And, uh, um, okay, so not that distinction so much as the distinction between practical skills versus theoretical knowledge. And as you can see implied from my title, this is a lie. Uh, <laughs> and this, uh, this dividing them into two completely different spheres is, is the law. And let me explain. So they, the distinction really goes down to, the, um, it, it connects really closely with uh, that between manual labor and intellectual work. So I gave the example of tennis and bicycle, which is of course something not in the category of manual labor. But if you think about farming, if you think about, you know, uh, 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 knitting, uh, or um, I don't know, you give me an example. What's a good example? First example of manual labor that comes to mind for you. Just throw something out. You can unmute yourself and just say it. Working at a factory line. Exactly. So some things are passing in front of you and you take it, do something, put it back and the next one comes in front of you. That's uh, factory work of some manual sort. As opposed to the intellectual work that as students you have, for instance, as you were preparing for your finals, you have immersed yourself in, obviously you know what intellectual work means. Now going along with that is, uh, if you think back to your elementary school days, and very explicitly in your high school days, maybe, maybe in between too during your middle school days, right? There is this idea of some people being more suited to manual labor and some people being more so suited to intellectual work. So for instance, I used to uh, hear my mother who was a teacher was you know, an intellectual, right? She would talk to people who were, let's say our helpers or you know, coming over to help or the kapuja, the, you know, the uh, building custodian, right? Uh, you would, or, or uh, you know, workers at the place of work, janitors, janitorial staff. Uh, and you talk to them about like, how are your kids doing? How is the boy? How is Mitten? You know, and, uh, and they would say, okuyo or okumijak, right? So that distinction between the ones that will continue their education and do things with their, that continue education and not continue education somehow. Um, Okusun okusun, right? That, that's that's we. Uh, so if um, if if parents gave up on someone and said uh, on on a kid and said okumi jack, that led them to divert the kid towards a path of maybe an apprenticeship, working with uh, working in the father's business, mother's parents' business, etc. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um. So we are in Turkey familiar with it, but we're also familiar with it in our own. Like the this group right now is obviously where we are all we were all diverted to the university life, right? It's a selected group. 
what is uh what do you remember in your college prep days when you were preparing for the university exams you were also wondering what am i suited for right what am i most suited for what is the kind of area that i'm most suited for and you distinguished maybe you came out from other people in your cohort in high school where they were going towards these maybe more certain different kinds of things and you and some others said we are going to i think i'm drawn to i don't know philosophy was among them i i suppose i think i'm drawn to some other like humanities discipline i'm simplifying greatly this isn't such a clear-cut thing that you notice one day and i don't mean to say that it is it took me forever to figure out that i wanted to do philosophy so and uh or you might say, I like reading. I'm going to go to enter. I'm going to try to go to Vosci. Let's see which department I can get in. And then I know that I can study a whole lot of different humanities things. That might have been your thought too. Anyway, so um, the idea is we have this idea that between manual work and intellectual work, and also maybe within intellectual work too, there are there's like this expectation we have that we're going to be, or people generally, all people generally are more suited to one of these more than the others. And if you studied any Plato, you know that it's also in there where he divides uh, people into three groups, right? There's the workers, there's the guardian, uh, there's the uh, um, auxiliaries, and there's the the rulers right so and he's not he doesn't think that aristocracy like is something that you come like earn from your parents by right but it has to do with personal aptitude so that the children are sifted into the three categories and they're going to then become whatever it is they were supposed to become and that's somehow distinguished from their from their in inner being right so i'm someone who's better suited to be a manual laborer you're someone who is better suited to be an intellectual worker and then there's of course the third group let's not worry about that right now just noticed chat okay um sorry i wanna oh i'm sorry what am i doing i wanted to I saw chat, I hit chat. Now I want to close chat. Instead, I'm doing other things, which I don't want to do. Um, you, you, can, uh, you can press the same uh, button and it closes. Got it. All right. So, um, Gramsci, I never thought I would, uh, I mean, I, I never engaged with Gramsci's work before I came to the US, which is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the chapter that my work, my uh, my lecture today, this lecture portion today is based on, is um, uh, uh, pretty much my only education about Gramsci. So I want to be open about that, uh, but it instilled in me a desire and curiosity to read more. Anyway, so uh, so this Italian Marxist philosopher, some of you might be uh, very familiar with the work. Some of you might. Uh, be experts in it, I don't know. So the idea is there are no, he said, there are no people who are naturally only suited to purely physical labor. But what happens is because of social construction, they get labeled that way. And you know how social construction changes people from, it takes us from where we are, but then it more says like the, I could have had hair just like John Bederhan's hair, right? But I would look a little odd, right? If I had that hair, <laughs> and um, and I could dress like him, and I could uh, hold my hold myself like him. But why don't I? Because I've been accustomed and socially, in in I've been socially morphed into acting in certain ways, wearing myself, holding my body in certain ways. So um, it's not that children themselves know what feminine means and what masculine or something else means, right? You know what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna have to uh, 
So social construction doesn't just classify and leave it at that, but in, within each group, of course, there will be effects of it uh, felt in the individuals. They won't even know that they're changing, but they will change and morph into the uh, shape that the social construction demands of them. They meet the norms that are, we meet the norms that are imposed on us. And uh, so as a result of that, you might see someone who now, when they're 25, they really seem very suited to physical labor and not suited to theoretical knowledge or intellectual work. But the idea is, this is an accident. This is not a, this is not their essence. This is not what defines them. They didn't have to be this way. They could have been both, for instance. They could have, I'm not saying intellectual create intellectual activity is more important or more valuable either, although that is part of the worry here. Uh, but they could have chosen differently. They could have been different. They could have done both. In fact, everyone who is doing any labor, physical labor, apparently at the expense of intellectual work is actually using their intellectual creativity. I mean, to the extent that that's possible, of course, if you look at a factory line, you may not notice it, but what song are they humming themselves at the same time, perhaps? Or what are, what are they, maybe their intellectual creativity is used somewhere else, not in the factory day. Their, uh, their time at the factory, but they have always, we all always have intellectual creativity working on us. Okay, so move over now to science and analytic philosophy. There's another, um, there's another counterpart to this idea. So to Gramsci's idea. So HM is the name of a patient, a very famous patient. If you, you might encounter uh, his name in um, psychology or neuroscience studies, or maybe in education. So HM is uh, one of the people who were studied extensively uh, when, when scientists looked at memory. So I have some notes I'm trying to put out here. Okay, so he suffered from, uh, if you know the parts of the brain, you'll understand this better, but he suffered from a temporal medial lobe lesion, part of the brain, okay? It had caused him to rapidly forget everything he knew. Everything he learned, he would rapidly forget. He could gain skills and improve his gained skills, but from one day to the next, he couldn't explicitly remember any of it, any of the instructions. And um, the standard interpretation of this phenomenon in uh, science and philosophy has always been, they've seen HM's case as proof that theoretical knowledge is one thing, knowing how or ma manual or like, uh, Handiwork knowledge, skills is something else. Proof proved by how lesion to uh, damage to one the damage to one part of the brain keeps your uh, skills intact, your handiwork skills intact, but it destroys your ability to know facts. Right, and since one can go without the other, this has seen as this was seen as proof that this is still seen encoded as proof that motor skills are not knowledge. It's not knowledge. Okay. And, um, and they did think this corresponded with the manual labor and intellectual reflection, right? So the idea is HM can still do manual labor, but he cannot do, he cannot engage in intellectual reflection. So those are, now we know that they think they thought they thought. Now we know that those are two different things. But Stanley and his uh, co um, 
co-author Krakauer, they showed that amnestic patients, I don't know why it's not amnesiac, amnestic, I don't know the difference, couldn't perform any of those things unless instruction was provided each day. Now instruction, of course, comes in the form of factual knowledge, right? It comes in that sentences. You, uh, it comes in a uh, propositional form. It comes in intellectual form, right? It might be about like buttons or whatever, but it, it is instruction and it can, it's not itself handiwork. They didn't like move his hand every day. Or they had to provide instruction every day. So, sorry. Um, so Stanley says, that the fact that they needed constant reinstruction re means that there may be a difference between procedural and declarative knowledge. That's fine, but it doesn't correspond to manual labor, manual labor and intellectual reflection, right? And uh, so the standard interpretation is is a bit prejudiced and biased off the get go, and Stanley actually speculates that what might have happened is that the division of society into thinking people and doing people is what researchers were trying to find a natural basis for. So they were looking for it and they found it. They thought they found it. So it's a little bit like the motivated reasoning where you can say things like, Women are like this, men are like this, let's look for proof of it. And now you set up the experimental conditions wrong or you interpret the data wrong and you find something that seems to support what you're thinking even though there's something the matter with the study rather than a genuine natural explanation for why women, let's say, knit better than men or the dishes better than men or whatever, <laughs> right? Okay, so now, John Dewey um, was a uh, very influential reformist of education, reformer of education and psychologist and philosopher. And he was against splitting education along the lines we've been looking at. And he um, thought that, um, there is, sorry, he thought that appreciating, uh, uh, appreciating thought and liberation of thought is something that all people stand to gain from. It's not useless for people and it will be needed and will be useful for them even if they're going to be a factory worker or whatever, farmer, etc. right? It is uh, something that everyone is equally capable of. Well, I mean, I don't know about equally, but it's not like there's this big division. That's the idea, right? I don't, there's, you know, there may be differences. Of course, there will be diversity, but it's not along those, these two lines of like manual and intellectual. That's not the case. And assuming that it is a splitting education along those lines, which is, which is another layer of this, it's not a good idea because everyone stands to gain from liber liberation of thought, from, from thinking about how does poetry relate to work? I don't love poetry, but there is poetry. This is poetry. I'll look at it for a while. I'll maybe memorize one poem. Um, I'll think about history. I'll think about political thought. I'll read Plato and criticize it. I mean, really anybody, stands to gain from these things, he says. Why did it happen then? Why was, why did Dewey's, why did Dewey lose the fight? It's not an accident, says Stanley. It, it helps social control. It helps, this division actually helps social control because for the majority of people, the majority of people will be manual laborers, and over time, you'll also see not only manual laborers, but professions go in there too, right? So there's theoretical thinkers on the one side, nurses are where? 
they're not you wouldn't put them in the category with um uh, factory workers of course they're they're different right there's there's like hierarchically nurses are above factory workers so it's not just about hierarchy but they their work is considered skilled manual skilled manual um kind of labor where if you're going to become a nurse your parents will tell you you don't have to worry about history or philosophy that's not you know or you can hear students say too i want to become a doctor why do i have to know about plato and it has nothing to do with that you heard this kind of thing in high school that you're you might have muttered it yourselves okay so but this kind of dividing um either between manual labor and practical manual labor generally like manual slash practical slash professional stuff versus liberal liberal thought it's by which i mean in the sense of like liberal education i don't mean progressive education necessarily i mean the kind of education where you look at some history without like becoming a history expert you look at some history you look at poetry you look at other literature you look at art you look at uh you take a variety of classes we tell you right at, at during your education especially first and second year that kind of liberal studies i mean and uh um not doing that or not letting uh masses let's say do that do that kind of work help social control the idea of driving it is this idea of social efficiency not that different from plato actually right plato thought it's best for the republic to have the three groups uh arranged this way so everyone does whatever they're suited to because then the collective is best served you are going to be most useful to society if you pick the vocation where you are what, the one that you are most suited to by your nature no one asks you is that what you want to do right do you really want to be do you really want i mean <laughs> suppose you have a great aptitude for philosophy would you rather be a gardener nobody asks you that right no if you have an aptitude for this you'll do that and the other way around maybe more sadly i don't know okay so um so this idea of social efficiency where the individual has to uh if necessary sacrifice their own desires right to do whatever it is that is going to be most useful to society sacrifice your liberty for the good of the whole and i put good in quotation marks because what the good of the whole is is itself a big question and so the the administrators or the the people who are in charge of education can define what the good of the whole is and say it's this capitalistic good or it's this it's this religious good or it's this maybe it is not a bad idea maybe it is a good good but <laughs> whatever it is is given by them there is a good of the whole and everybody else has to get in line sacrifice their own individual liberty for the good of the whole do they play a part in defining what the good of the whole is no right they don't get to call the shots on that that's given to them from above prevents people then from uh why does it help social control because it prevents people nurses factory workers homemakers stay at home moms they call them here um you know mother your mothers your grandmothers it pre prevents us from encountering the ideas that would help us define and pursue our own good and it prevents us from encountering ideas that would help them or encourage us to be civically engaged so take part in the democracy write a letter like like an write an open letter to the newspaper <laughs> <laughs> or um or say um or campaign for the cause that you believe in or notice that 
when your liberties are curtailed, even if you didn't care to use those liberties at this time, you might have wanted to, so you should maybe fight for them anyway, etc. Okay, so that's really the end of what I have to say. <laughs>